<laughs> Setting up streaming the live. It's getting there. All right. I see that. I got a note. You hooked up, man. You good? Hang on. Okay. Good morning, everybody. It's Jeff Goldberg here on the East Coast of New, uh, in New York on Long Island. Today is Friday, not, not January, June 12th. It's 10 <laughs> o'clock. And uh, welcome to the Sales Pro Network. This is a Facebook Live. Uh, I am the founder of the Sales Pro Network, and I put this group together so that we could elevate the uh, profession of selling. Uh, this is a place where you can come and ask questions and get coaching from not just myself. I'm a sales trainer, a sales coach, and an outsourced sales manager. There are other terrific sales training professionals in here that can give you advice. You can post comments. You can ask questions and get great advice. You can post challenges and success stories and get great interviews like we're going to do right now. Um, it is my pleasure. By the way, if you have any questions during this hour, please put them in the comments section. I will occasionally be looking down, not that I wanna disrespect our great guest uh, by not looking him in the eye, but I do wanna see the comments. Good morning to Michael Rosenberg. Uh, hi, Dennis Lombardi, Melinda Roth Epstein, Steve Kent, good morning, everybody. And I wanna say good morning to my guest today. Um, I know this gentleman for many, many years. He is a true genius at what he does. Mitch Topol is a wow. partner at CGT Marketing. He is a marketing and social media guru. I can personally attest to his uh, ability and, and I have to say magnificence. Mitch has designed two websites <laughs> for me. He designed my logo, my business cards, my letterhead. He is absolutely my go-to marketing guy for social media in general and certainly marketing. Mitch, welcome to Facebook Live and the Sales Pro Network. Thanks, Jeff. I am. I, it's. I was so excited when you asked me. I have to tell you because I love you. You're fabulous in sales training and coaching. And uh, to be live on Facebook is just, uh, it's a thrill for me. So uh, I love it. As you know, I hate speaking. So, I, you know. Yes, you hate it about as much as I do. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Good right. morning also to Lisa Levitin. And uh, I respect her. He says that uh, he loves you and you are a marketing uh, uh, wizard. Uh, actually, Michael Rosenberg also said you're a marketing wizard. You must be a wizard. And hi to Jeff. Yes, I'm missing my hat today. Sorry, guys. And my little... So uh, let's get started with, why don't you tell everybody just a little bit about who you are, what you did to get to here, uh, how you got to CGT marketing, and also what you love about marketing in general. Take it away, Mitch. Wow. Big question, Jeff. Good question. Thank you, sir. Um, so it, it all started for me some years back. Um, after having gone to school and got a bachelor's of science in graphic design and minored in marketing, which uh, I just found vibrated well. It just kind of clicked with me. And I started to do that. And I uh, got a job actually as an ad age, with an ad agency in the city, which will run, remain nameless. But it was an incredible experience taking the train every day and had an epiphany. I looked in the window one day and I saw myself grow old on the train. I said, I got to get off of here. So I did. So I naturally was networking and I... Uh, Networked my way into Weight Watchers International and started to provide uh, uh, design services for them and marketing services for a bunch of years. Never did the large media buys. Um, we were more focused on uh, the franchise opportunities for that uh, consumer service and products, actually. Helped them introduce some food. But it's been a long journey. I love marketing because there it, it requires... Uh, uh, a very thoughtful and, 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 and a process-driven approach to something that is totally out of your control. Marketing exists in a passive environment, which you have absolutely no control over. As totally opposite for you, Jeff, you sit across from someone in sales, you read their body language, you hear their tone of voice, you see where they're looking, not looking, and you respond instinctively. I mean, you're an excellent salesperson. You could see where someone's going. You're thoughtful in your process, right? For marketing, you don't have that. So you have to understand your target markets as much as humanly possible uh, to be able to create messaging and then choose the channels to get to them. So it's a fascinating. And certainly over the last eight years, my business has taken a 180. I mean, how I 
uh, my company, CGT Marketing, creates profits today is 180 degrees different than it did uh, eight years ago. Um, and today, in this marketing environment, uh, digital is king. It's the play. Uh, it's what I'm shouting from the rooftops. So, so uh, 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 first of all, Lisa Leviton says, uh, big hug. Uh, oh. Morning to Scott Mason and Lee Green also and Larry Weiss. Um, I, I do, I, I want to get to some specific advice for salespeople, but before we do that, I am curious about something. Uh, I know we've kind of chatted about it a little bit before, but how in the world do you keep up on everything that's going on, especially in social media? I, I consider you not just a marketing guy, but also a social media expert. And to mm -hmm. me, it seems like it's changing by the, not the second, but the millisecond. There's always a new platform. And <laughs> even on the ones that are uh, current, like, like Facebook yeah. changes by the day. How do you keep up on all that, Mitch? Yeah, I'm, I'm laughing because yes, the millisecond is actually accurate. Uh, I really don't keep up on it. You know, you call me an expert. And uh, frankly, I'm flattered by that. Thank you. And oh, before I forget, a big hug to Lisa. Haven't seen her in a while. I'd love to give her a hug. Anyway, um, so here's my process, right? Because things are changing rapidly. And even now, I mean, from week to week, we're going from crisis to crisis, uh, is that every single week, we are discussing uh, messaging for all our clients. What should we be talking about? What should we not talking about? We need to be sensitive to the marketing environment, sensitive to what their customers and prospects are going through, because you have to be empathetic in today's environment. So that's like a microcosm of what's happening right now in terms of the ecosystem, the social media ecosystem. Um, it, although there are new tools that are coming out all the time, I think we've sort of reached a saturation point for a number of channels, in my opinion. I don't think there's going to be uh, hot new channels coming out anytime soon. The only new channels that are being adopted are by the next generation, right? So we have boomers, we have Generation X, we have the millennials, we have Generation Z. Generation Z now has embraced TikTok, as has a bunch of boomers. It's sort of a novelty. And marketing through TikTok is, um, to say the least, uh, challenging. They haven't tweaked their model yet. So to me, uh, uh, it's, it's a constant reading. It's constant research. You know, I get, I get uh, well, yesterday I got 424 emails. So I'm on tons of listservs. I, I don't read them all. I'm just human. I have to do some work. But um, I do uh, read quite a bit, uh, download white papers from other people, and uh, actually look at what's happening the, the results that we find specifically with social media in the digital environment with our clients, we're incredibly reactive now, more than ever before. We actually change from day to day. Um, quick example, if I may. Last week, uh, you know, we had that incredible day on Tuesday for Black Lives Matter. Now, uh, whether you agree with it or not, that's your opinion, right? Uh, my opinion, I have mine. This is not a political discussion. And with our clients, we gave them a choice. If you want to support this movement, we're with you 100%. We will create posts that are appropriate for this, this day. If you don't, then we take everything off. And then we created a different set of posts for the following day focused on peace and unity, which uh, actually all the clients really kind of went for because they felt very uh, sensitive in putting information out there for their brand, as do a lot of clients do. So that's a very deep deep, deep involved conversation. And, and it's changing minute by minute. In the morning, it was great to use the hashtag Black Lives Matter. By the afternoon, it was clogging up. No one wanted it, right? In the morning, it was great to use a black screen on social media. In the afternoon, you couldn't have it. So uh, uh, you have to continually adapt, keep your head in the game. Um, and to me, it's a lot of fun. Look, I can't, some days it's like, ah, oh, enough already. You know, and some days I'm, I'm, I can't wait to see what's going on. So it's a, um, it's, inc it's incredible. It really yeah. is how fast things change. It, it, it's interesting you bring that up about the Black Lives Matter thing. Um, uh, obviously, it's on everybody's mind, no matter which side of the uh, aisle you're, you're on about it or, or mm -hmm. where you stand about it. And yesterday I was walking the dog and I, uh, I was listening to uh, the news as I was walking the, the beach pug who's sleeping right behind me. Hopefully he stays quiet for this entire uh, time. And uh, a thought popped into my head and I said, I'm going to post this on Facebook. 
And as I was walking, I go, you know what? Some people are going to agree with this. Some people are going to hate it. It's just not worth it. You really have to be incredibly cautious if mm -hmm. you're, uh, because whether you're expressing a personal opinion or not, it is affecting your business. We actually have a question for you already. Uh, by the way, uh, Double K, Carol Krugley says, only virtual hugs, Mitch. Oh, uh, so, uh, sorry, Keith Carol. Ginsburg. I can't wait to give you a hug. You too, Mike. Uh, Keith Ginsburg wants to know, would you use Facebook to target adults around financial education and invest investing? Absolutely. Facebook is the big boy in the room. They're the king. They have over 2 billion people. And the New York Times published that their audience has increased 27% over the past few weeks. 27%. Everybody's on Facebook. So Facebook has, and if I just may just go stay here for just a second, Jeff, Facebook has technology that allows you to zero in on exactly the interests and behavior patterns of your audience. So if your audience are, I'm sorry, financial advisors, is it? Uh, financial education, uh, adults around financial education and investing. Okay. So, so for Facebook, uh, I would recommend that, uh, you go for interests so you can actually tailor your audience and cause Facebook is just another media channel. It, they make their money through advertising. So you can tailor your audience to the interests, those specific interests, and then have great messaging to get uh, a lot of engagement. Got it. We've got another question for you. Uh, Lizzie, it's a, I'm going to read this. It's a, I'm with a company where they create social media content for us, which I greatly appreciate. But mm -hmm. coming from my last job where I created the content for the company, I realized the importance of using your own, the business owner's voice to promote your business. I am allowed to create my own content and submit it for approval to my company. I'm new to my industry, so I'm still very early on in building my business. Would you recommend that I take the time to create my own content right now to submit for approval to my company or wait till I'm more established? Well, I don't know her job title or responsibility, so it's hard for me to tell her to go ahead and create content. The, her direct report may have her responsibility someplace else. But let me address the bigger issue, which she touched on, which was tone. She said, uh, speaking in the, bo in the boss's tone, I believe was her exact words, right? The business owner's voice. Business owner's voice, thank you. So the business owner voice. So every single social media client we take on, we spend time, hours, talking about the tone and the quality of the voice that's used when we write for that client. Every client has a different tone of voice because they're in a different industry, they have a different culture, we want to position them differently. People don't generally understand and it sounds like Lizzie has a, an idea or a feeling that actually how it's written makes an impact. And she's absolutely right. How she's you a life write- insurance agent, by the way. I'm sorry? He's a life insurance agent. Oh, wow, great. Uh, don't need any right now, but thanks. That's a, um, or Jeff would sell me on that, by the way, but that's a whole nother issue. Um, so uh, writing uh, content, if you're good at it, uh, then I would actually recommend doing it. You know, it's fascinating that you bring that up because my, my brain is kind of going in five different directions and I'll narrow it down to one. We have found over the past three months with our clients, we have increased our communication and collaboration because of the very fast changing environment of social media. We've had to have this collaboration. We have found that being tighter knit as two organizations, the outside company and the client themselves, we've actually had better results, better outcomes, and more consistent brand touches as a client experience for the visitors than we've seen before. We have engagement rates that have increased over 2,000%, click throughs over 980%. And I, yeah, it's, a, it's amazing. And I, I kind of, we kind of stumbled on this because of what's happening. So I would tell her, write the content, you know, and work very, very close with that outside agency. Now, here's where the rub is. Their ego has to be able to uh, take content from you. Um, uh, it's very important that this gets open and talked about that, look, we want to create content. It's no, it's no rub on your creating content. Let's do this together. So egos have to be assuaged in order for this to work very, very well. That makes sense. Um, 
So could you please define, I, I know I have a, a, my own definition for the, dif the differences between sales and marketing, but um, first of all, could you define the two? And also, uh, do you think that in a corporation that sales and marketing should be in one department? Okay, so I'll address the last question first. The answer is no, they should be separate because they have two totally different functions, but they, are so, they should be so intertwined and connected. They should be working together. Um, you know, the alignment of sales and marketing is potentially for any company, the largest opportunity to improve the business today, the largest, because imagine if sales knew exactly what marketing was doing, marketing knew exactly what sales were doing, and both entities were focused on the same accounts. You'd have better, quicker sales outcomes. You'd have more engagement in marketing. And it would just be it's sort of a wonderful thing. So let me get to specifics. Marketing functions include uh, research development, pricing, distribution, customer service, communications. And marketing is subservient to the business objectives. Right? Sales, from my point, is where all the action happens. Unless you're running an e-com or e -com company and you're leaning on marketing to create drive website traffic and sales, that's one thing. But sales to me, the person to person is everything. Now you'll see that in big equipment, uh, 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 service-based businesses, um, you know, anything that requires salespeople. So sales is the, the boots on the ground, the voice on the phone, the picture on the Zoom call right now today. You know, no one's really visiting offices or uh, hopefully that will change. So they are focused on selling, bringing people through that sales process. Marketing should support that every single step of the way. We're in an environment now where uh, your clients and prospects want to sell themselves. They go to a website. And if you don't have all the information for every step in that sales funnel, you're done. You're gone. So where do you get that information from? From the salespeople. They have the gold. They talk to the clients. They know basically the steps. They're not looking at it from a marketing standpoint. So that's why there has to be uh, weekly meetings between sales and marketing. Do fun things together. Establish relationships between marketing and sales departments. Um, yeah. Attend events. Marketing should attend the, the weekly sales meetings. A, the head of sales should attend. Maybe all the salespeople should attend the marketing meetings because the input, look, um, I can't stress this enough, and I guess I'm getting a little emphatic, and I'm, I try to nail this down. Um, I, when I take on a client, I go with the salesperson to the meeting. Oh, my gosh, because what happens at that meeting is everything. You know, I look at the body language. I see what the client's responding to. The salesperson has a different mindset. All they want to do is sell the service or product. I'm looking at it from how can I adapt this gold this 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 uh, this action that's happening between into a message that'll work in a passive environment and attract that prospect before they even want to talk to a salesperson. So yeah. that's how critical that is. That alignment is. You have to be friends, not enemies. <laughs> I actually think that's one of the reasons I consider you so great at what you do is because when we first met and sat down and chatted. I realized I was talking to a marketing guy that actually understood sales. And in my, <laughs> my personal experience, that's not really the case. I have, a, I have a very basic definition of marketing and sales. To me, it's marketing's job to bring in leads. It's sales job to close those leads. But in, uh, as you know, I've worked in tiny little companies that nobody's ever heard of, as well as major corporations that everybody knows. And my mm. experience is in most organizations, sales and marketing are working like this instead of what you did like this. And I, I was going to ask you, how do you think they could work better together? And I think what you just said is, is terrific. You know, sales should be attending the marketing meetings. Marketing should be attending the sales meetings. I do have another question about that, though. Often I find, especially in larger organizations, the head honcho, whether it's a honcho or a honchette, uh, is both the sales and the marketing guru, the VP mm -hmm. of sales and marketing. Uh, do you think that's a good thing that one person should be in charge of both or should that be separated? Great question. Um, I, I, from my philosophy should be separate. Now, here's what happens. Either the sales manager gets, okay, uh, you take care of marketing too, because it's the same thing. And the problem is, is that sales, a salesperson is not a marketing person. 
they're not devoting, you know, how do you, de- uh, how do you divide your time? 50% up for marketing, 50% for sales. A salesperson wants to make sales. That's what they love to do. They usually don't like marketing. So what happens? Marketing gets thrown in the trash can. It gets a, a short shrift and sales thinks of it. Yeah, just create a brochure, do, do a Facebook post or something like that when it's so much more intense, so much more integral. When marketing gets hoisted, all right, uh, manage the sales force too, they're lost because marketing is a set of different processes. It has, it has everything to do with sales, yet it's a totally different mindset as it approaches the customer. A salesperson is not really interested in messaging. Salesperson is not really interesting in a reach versus frequency or how many people do, do we need connect with in order to generate leads or drive traffic to the site? And can we have gated contact? And where's the white paper coming from? That's what marketing is about right now. You know, sales is about, okay, where's my guy or girl I need to talk to? Get him on the phone, call him. Hey, what's up? Establish that relationship, right? So if you think of marketing in terms of how they're similar to sales, Marketing in this environment is establishing a digital relationship with a potential customer. Sales is establishing a personal one-to-one relationship. They are the personal face of the corporation. Yeah, and uh, I've often found, and I, I, I hate when I do, it, it, it's both parties are complaining about each other. The leads suck, the salespeople don't know how to close business. Yeah. instead of working together. And, and really, it should be a symbiotic relationship. And I like what you said before, the salespeople have great information that they can bring back that the marketing mm. department can use. And the marketing department should be going to the salespeople to, to chat about that. And if everybody works together, I, we keep using this, but that's the perfect example. If everybody mm. works together, because everybody really is working towards the same goal, although they have a different objective for their jobs, it's mm. all about how do we bring in more business so everybody gets paid and the business grows. Um, Agreed. I want to talk a little bit uh, about salespeople who have to do their own marketing. I guess that's kind of a self-serving thing, but so many of us today, especially solopreneurs like uh, myself, have to yeah. do everything uh, mm-hmm. unless we you know, are smart enough or, or have the money to, to pay a guy like you. So when a salesperson has to be their own marketing department, mm-hmm. what are some of the most effective ways to do that? In other words, how can an individual salesperson, whether they own their own business or not, how can they generate more leads and more opportunities for themselves? What do you think are some of the best ways? Okay. So this goes back to the target market that the salesperson is after, right? So here's a word I'm going to use, intentional. Choose intentionally. So salespeople have limited time. They can't spend all day long talking, thinking about marketing, what channels you'll be on, what content should we post. They need to generate leads to be able to follow up and do business. Sales is boots on the ground, active, right? Let's make those relationships. So what I'm saying is choose the time to spend intentionally, right? If you sell on B2B, LinkedIn is the key. Become an expert on LinkedIn. Get training from Beth Granger, right? You know, use LinkedIn as word. You know, there's a there's a wonderful tool to help you. Crystal knows it's a uh, downloadable extension uh, from um, on on Chrome. It's an extension on Chrome, and when you open up LinkedIn, there's a little bar there. When you visit someone's profile, click on it. It will give you the personality profile of that person. What quadrant do they fit in? Sort of a disc profile, a Myers-Briggs profile type of thing. And that allows you a deeper understanding of who they are and what channels they're using. So here's where the bridge comes, right? If you're a single uh, salesperson or a solopreneur, uh, you have incredibly limited time. So pick one social media channel to use. One. First, make sure your website is tight. Loads super duper fast. It has all the information on it that you need to bring someone through the sales cycle. Second, pick something that is reaching out to your potential prospects. So pick one channel. Don't give me this Facebook, IG, Instagram, or I should be on TikTok because my 17-year-old cousin said I should be. They're not your target. Well, if they're your target market, then okay. That's where you should be. But generally speaking, uh, that's not where it should be. And it generally boils down to either LinkedIn or Facebook. So choose one, right? Choose one. And if you're on one, spend budget 
20 to 25 minutes a day to focus on social selling through that channel. What do I mean? Each of those, each channel has groups. For instance, LinkedIn has sandboxes for all your clients. They're in there now. What are they doing? They're chatting, they're reading discussions. Become part of it. Become a great social citizen. Add value, be authentic. Don't sell through the channel. Look to establish a digital relationship through these channels. That's what social selling is about, is putting yourself out there. You know, uh, and because you don't have limited time, look to curate information for content. So generally speaking, when we take a social media account, you know, we're being hired to create content. So for us, this is like a 60-20-10, 60% creating brand new content, 20% curated, which means we find information from a source and we repost it through the channels and 10% promotional. We're actually selling, because people want to sell stuff. Hello, they expect it, we're gonna give it to them. So for the solopreneur, I flip it. It's 60, 20, 10, where 60 is curated, 20 is original, and 10 is promotional. Because the time, well, what is that? 60, 20, 80, oh, you could spend more. So 70, 20, 10, or 60, 30, 10, right? And my percentages are off a little bit. But it's it's a, it's a fluid, forgive me, I'm not a, math major i'm a you're a marketing guy not a numbers guy <laughs> hey uh lisa Levitin, i got a calculator right here man <laughs> lisa Levitin asked a question that i also had what was the name of it is it crystal nose mm -hmm. c-r-y-s-t-a-l-k-n-o-w-s.com and go to that website on uh your chrome browser download the extension now you get 10 free and then you have to pay, but I think it's uh, 30 bucks a month or something. And, but the insight into what you can learn about the individual person, because they look through AI algorithms at all the posts, everything they've done, their profiles, and come up with a this profile, come up with, hey, this person is pragmatic. You're not buying them a cup of coffee, you're talking business right from the get-go, you know? as opposed to a process person. Yeah, we've got, a, we've got another question, but before we get to that one quickly, could you just break down those approximate percentages again for Lisa? Yeah, sure. So uh, if you're outsourcing it, uh, what we do is, uh, I gotta make a mad up to 100. 70, 20, 10, 70 original content we create, 20% curated, 10% promotional. Uh, for some accounts, we actually go as high as 80, 85% content created. For the solopreneur, for the person who has limited time, I'd flip that and say it would be 70% curated, 20% original, and 10% promotional. And that goes for any channel, Facebook or LinkedIn. It's okay to sell on LinkedIn. Just don't do it all the time. People will un unlike you. You well, and also, uh, and I talked about this, you mentioned Beth Granger, who is a LinkedIn specialist. Uh, mm -hmm. And I talked about this with her and I know that you feel the same way. Y you can't be beating people over the head as soon as they connect with you on LinkedIn. Uh, I, I liken it to dating, you know, buy them a drink first, get to know people and then talk about business. But first, be interested in them. Yeah. Uh, Dale Carnegie said it's better to be interested than interesting. We have another question um, uh, from David Sherrick. I don't know if you remember David, but- uh, Of course. Uh, David says, happy Friday, great job as usual. When I create a post for my business on Facebook, I get an opportunity to boost that post for a nominal fee. Is it typically worth doing that or is it better to hope it grows organically? Um, first of all, hey, David, nice to hear from you and happy Friday to you too. Um, so uh, let's, let's talk about something that's critical here for social media that you brought up. Organic growth is a zero sum game now. Each of these social channels have tweaked their model because they, they're interested in making money. Look, the recent decision by Mark Zuckerberg was made on greed and power, had nothing to do with Justin Wright. And there's anarchy within that company. But be that as it may, let me, I'm off course. To answer your question is yes, boost it. Please boost it. It won't get anywhere. You need to boost it. First off is that if you're on Facebook, you should immediately start a li monthly like campaign. And you could do that for as little as a couple of bucks a month, a day rather, a couple of bucks a day. Um, and then pick and choose. So here's a, uh, one of my Facebook ad hacks for very limited budgets. 
because most of our clients were boosting almost every post every time we we post something. We we normally post it at a, a, a the most opportune time for organic, and then we boost it to a specific audience. So here's my hack. If you can't afford to boost every post, which you could throw 10 bucks at it and see what happens, it's fine. What you do is you put up a post and you see within eight hours what type of likes it gets. If it's above average, boost it because your money is going to be well spent. You will get a lower cost per click or low cost per thousand. If it's lower than average, don't bother. You, you're kind of wasting your money, no matter how much you love the post. I know you create it. You probably love it, but it's okay. Not every post's a winner. Not every one. Look, marketing's a great big experiment. So what I'm saying is the hack is if you see organic growth, you see it kind of, it's, wow, this is kind of cool. We've got, you know, I mean, if, if let's just say, uh, like, uh, you know, I was just looking at posts this morning before I came on because I review them every day. One post had um, 850 uh, likes uh, within a, um, let's see, it was posted last night, within a 12-hour window. That was above average for this client. They're, they're a, a, a consumer product good, CPG. That was above average. So I said, bam, let's, we're, we're boosting this puppy. And I threw 40 bucks behind it to specific audiences. And that's the flip of this. Boosting it, must. We don't take, I don't take on a social media client unless there's a, a budget for social promotion. Won't do it because it's a waste, it's a waste of their money. Better to give me the money and I'll go travel. I'll drive somewhere, send them a postcard. Gotcha. But, pardon? <coughs> I said, got it. Oh, so uh, the other flip side is not just boosting it, but create audiences to boost it too. The technology is that, look, Facebook has so much information about each of us. If you ask them to build a profile of you, then you ask somebody you love who loves you to build a profile, Facebooks will be more accurate because they're judging you based on your, they have everything. So you have the availability to create audiences in many, many different ways. But look at, look at the, if you're interested, just give me a shout, David. I'm sure I'll, I'll help, I'll help you. I'll walk you through it for about 15 minutes. My pleasure. Great. Uh, Fran, the, the Chrome extension is Crystal, C-R-Y-S-T-A-L, knows K-N-O-W-S. And Lisa's asking another question. What does the 10% promotional include? Whatever you sell. You know, um, it's okay to sell through social. It's okay. Just don't be, you know, it has to be roughly 10%. Can be high as 15% sometimes, but you don't want to lose people, right? Uh, you don't want to churn likes or people uh, because that's the, probably the number one reason why people sort of unfollow you is because you have too many promotional messages. So keep it down, keep it to 10%. Now, I, I be, is Lisa in the insurance space, Jeff? Do you know? Uh, Lisa, I believe, is in, uh, 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 isn't she a recruiter? A recruiter? I think so. Well, if she's a recruiter, LinkedIn is like uh, the kitchen. That's where you headhunt people all day long. Um, like, like you, I haven't seen her in years. Yeah, 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 yeah. Unfortunately. Um, and uh, what's the difference between original and curated content? Original content is something you write yourself or you have a third party write for you. Um, curated is when it's written, at, uh, someone else wrote it, not from someone you hire, but from a reputable source. Let's say, uh, like for instance, we have a nail polish client, National Nail Polish. The, if anybody likes vegan nail polish, let me know. This client's the bomb. Anyway, you can see my nails. Um, so uh, 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 I forgot where I was. I got uh, lost. Curated. In the curated, curated, right. Curated. So we see an article from uh, Vogue magazine on how to treat your nails great. We'll say, oh, that's a good article. We will actually uh, put that in one, uh, one or two or three or four of the feeds that we use, the channels that we use for this client. That's curated. Now, don't copy content and say it's your own. That's verboten. Always make sure there's a link to the content. They get full copyright privileges. Uh, real important to treat that uh, treat it appropriately. Got it. Okay. And Lisa says she's in insurance and PEL. 
Uh, Keith Ginsburg is asking, what about just reposting in groups? Reposting? In groups. Uh, well, groups are incredibly powerful. They can make or break a business. Um, you know, the moms groups around Long Island are incredibly powerful. You know, there are stories like from massive people moms of killing a restaurant because one of the people in the groups who was very vocal in the groups trashed a restaurant and the restaurant got killed. Um, I'm not sure what Keith means by reposting. If you can clarify that a little bit. Start typing, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> So groups are fabulous. So let me just talk about groups. And I think what he's talking about is a Facebook group. Uh, Facebook groups are incredible. They've, uh, Facebook actually has retooled them. They have a tremendous amount of features now, probably some that no one even knows. There's mentoring within the groups. There's all kinds of stuff. But the power of the group is sort of a herd mentality. So if you're allowed to be part of the group, join a group that's important to your business, right? For Keith, uh, I believe it's divorce, right? Keith, isn't that the key? No, this is another time? Keith. Uh, Keith is, uh, he owns a tutoring company. And oh, I spoke to him. That's right. We spoke about groups. That's right. So the mom, mom's groups are great. So what I said to Keith was, is get in the groups and just be a guy helping everybody. Add value. You're an educator. You know how many parents want information about teaching their kids because they're locked in solitude? You know, it's it, it's uh, it's primo. Now, if he's talking about reposting content from outside into a group, that's fine, as long as it's appropriate, and that you give the proper credentials. You don't post it like it's your own. Hey, here's this great article from so and so on teaching your kids how to bounce on a in a bouncy trampoline safely or, or whatever it is. I don't know. Yeah, he's saying uh, reposting content instead of boosting. That's what he's asking about. Okay, so you can't boost within a group, right? But you can repost content. Reposting content and boosting it is fine. Understand that when you're boosting, you, you're promoting that source, not yours. So here's another hack for you. When you repost content from anybody, you must put a comment on it before the content. People look to you for your point of view. Like Jeff, if you found this art, great article that you liked on sales or whatever, whatever it is, right? And you reposted it, you should put a comment on, this was great article. Look at the three tips towards the end of the article. They're fantastic. It's what I say all the time. Now you're putting this article in your context so it becomes a brand touch point because people look to you for sales expertise. They want to know, oh, you just sent me an article? Who cares? But if you make the article, oh, this is a great article. Well, why is it a great article? Give them a little tidbit on why it's a great article. You're putting it in context. That's a hack to get a higher engagement and to create a positive brand experience for you and or your company. Got it. Good. And what about... Um... As you know, I create videos. I typically post them on LinkedIn. I'm not talking about the video that you and I are doing right now uh, on the Facebook Live, but um, what's your feeling about posting the same content, whether it's written video or anything else on different platforms or does it need to be changed for each platform? I'm all for it. Um, content can be retashed, reused. Uh, very old content can be recycled if it's appropriate. Creating content is probably the number one challenge for any company trying to get involved digitally, especially social media or blogging. It's, it's the hardest thing for most companies to do. That's why people hire us, right? So any content we, we create, we create for the different channels. Now understand that although the visual uh, image that goes with it may be exactly the same, there are distinct differences. Facebook is a more informal, uh, more friendly environment. LinkedIn is very professional, although it's kind of like a used car lot now, but it's a very professional environment. So the style with which you post, the style and tone of copy, you need to edit it. Twitter is 140 characters, right? Or 280, or if you want to roll up a few posts, that's fine. But you need to edit it down. In addition, for each channel, excuse me, <clears throat> there's a hashtag strategy. 
Now, hashtags are critical for every single channel because it's a way to widen the scope, widen the touch of your post. Anybody searching for a topic, you could come up and they don't follow you. They never heard of you. And now you have a brand new touch point. However, there's a different hashtag strategy for each social channel. It's, it's something that's another hack of mine that almost no one thinks about. They just throw hashtags, yeah, hashtag, I'm wonderful. You know, hashtag, love you, hashtag, woohoo. You know, when hashtag is a critical piece of the online ecosystem to be able to connect to people who are looking for or want certain things or have certain interests. But your strategy for each channel needs to change. If someone's interested, just email me. I could send you an article on it. Um, haven't published it yet. Will. You know, content's a little hard to do. <laughs> so, um, the question really came because I thought, and I may be, I may be confusing uh, things, but um, I thought that it actually counts against you when the spiders are crawling along through uh, throughout the internet if if they if they find the same content in different in different uh, on different platforms. Is that no longer true, or was that? Well, matter? that's why you have to rewrite it. Uh, maybe I didn't make. I, I apologize if I didn't communicate that clearly. For instance, we create a post, uh, post for Facebook and we know that a certain number of words is optimal, right? Used to be really short. Now it's okay if it's longer. It always changes. Every week it changes. Anyway, what we do is we take that, we edit it down for Twitter and we throw a tweet up with the same gist, the same image, but it's different copy. It has a different syntax. And then we rewrite it for the company page post or if we're writing it for a specific person for their LinkedIn post, we want it to be personal from them or from the company on LinkedIn. We'll actually rewrite the post. It'll say the same thing, but it'll just have different uh, syntax and possibly different uh, word usage as well. Okay, so you do need to make some changes. By the way, we're getting some people who are very interested in that hashtag article. Maybe if you would email it to me, I'll post it here on the Sales Pro Network. Uh, uh, below this um, this recording when it's done. Um, okay, for, the, for those that want it, uh, just give me a couple hours. I have to edit it a little bit. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, you and I have talked a little bit about this before. Uh, I, I, you from the marketing side and me from the sales side, but could you maybe talk a little bit about the importance of um, creating an ideal client profile? Oh my gosh. It's one of the first things that we do with a new client. In addition to going on a sales call, we actually survey and interview their customers, a random selection of customers to understand their perceptions, and then interview internally, right, to see where the misalignment is. And then we create what's called, you call the buyer profile, uh, Jeff? Ideal, ideal client profile, ICP. Ideal client profile and marketing is called the buyer persona. You know, I don't care what terms you use. All it is, it's really just a written document of your ideal client outlining exactly who they are. And you give them a fake name, right? For like, if you're going after marketing executives, you might call them marketing Mitch and you have a picture of somebody. And what's the age range? What type of lifestyle are they living? Are they married? Do they have kids? Do they like to take vacations? If you don't know the answers to this, you don't know the people you're marketing to. So it needs there needs to be some information gathering because a great ideal profile is made on demographic information, behavioral information, these are quantifiable data, and educated speculation. One of the critical pieces of an ideal client profile, buyer persona, whatever your flavor is, is that you write down what the number one and number two goals that your prospect has and needs to achieve that you can help with, right? Not only what they wanna do, but what are the bumps in the road for them to get there? What are the challenges they have in reaching that goal? Because again, are you, are you a painkiller or are you a vitamin? Right? right now, everybody needs to be a painkiller. That's short term. Vitamin is long term. People are not thinking long term. You got to be a painkiller. You need to know what challenges your customers have, your prospects have in attaining whatever their perception of their goal is. Not what you think. It's their perception and their perception of their challenges. If you don't know, start talking to customers. Start finding out what it is. Ask them pointed questions. Um, critical.
that's probably the most critical piece of the whole thing. Because once you know the challenges that they have in achieving their goals, you can help them get to their goals. You're solving a problem. You're a painkiller. Yeah. Boom, you got business. Yeah, on the sales side, <coughs> excuse me, uh, on the sales side, uh, I always advise people to define who their best customer is. You could actually look historically, you know, mm -hmm. who are the people you enjoy doing business with, who pays you the most, or whatever criteria you want to use. But I suggest that if you don't know what you're looking for, it makes it incredibly hard to find it. So oh when you're God. prospecting, you want to figure out who should I be prospecting to? I'm not a big fan of generalists. I, I think somebody who's more specific uh, is more likely to be successful. Um, don't you love when you walk into an office and say, well, who do you sell to? And they say, oh, I sell to everybody. <laughs> well, okay. Yeah, that, that, that's kind of like me coming to the networking group that we, we both belong to and saying, well, uh, a great referral for me is any company that has salespeople uh, other than retail because I don't really train retail. Now, while that's true, it makes it difficult for you and the other 25 or 30 people attending that meeting to go, well, how can I refer to Jeff? Because it's too big. But when I say, well, any company that has salespeople is a good lead for me. However, I've done a lot of work in the world of advertising. I've done a lot of work in the world, blah, blah, blah. So the easier we make it for our networking partners to help us by being specific, it's the same thing when you're looking for prospects yourself. If you don't know what you're looking for, you're looking for everybody. And uh, I, I don't think that works very well. It, it is the same in marketing, yes? Exactly. So it takes a different flavor because if we know who you're marketing to specifically, now we could find out who they are and what they want to accomplish and we can create a message to attract them. Yeah, and, and I love what you said earlier about uh, you actually take the time to interview your clients, customers. Yes. Uh, I, remember, I remember when we first started working together, it wasn't really interviewing my customers uh, mm -hmm. to find out about uh, why they do business with me, although that did come out of it, but you actually went to my customers and videotaped them uh, giving testimonials for my website. And if anybody goes to my website, even today, they find many, if not most of the pages have my customers saying nice things about me. And the reason I thought that was so brilliant is because my website says nice things about me that I say, but why should any of my customers, any of my prospects trust me? Now, they should because I'm a trustworthy guy, but how do they know that? They also know I'm a salesperson. And to many people, if not most people, that means I'm a liar, a thief, and a cheat, and I'll do and say anything to get their money, which of <laughs> course is not true, but that is the right. perception. And I think we'll agree perception is reality. So yes. it's really powerful when you went around and yeah. asked my customers to open up about me. Yeah, that's called social proof, by the way. And I highly recommend that. Um, every website is working harder now than ever before. So it's gotta be fast and you have to have social proof and video testimonials are absolutely, well. just don't put them on the homepage. Whoa, um, but uh, yeah, it was great that we did that. It was so funny doing that too. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. Uh, anything else you wanna share with the team? Uh, I do have one more question. And uh, um, you know, given that we're going through an incredibly crazy time in this country be be between the social unrest, the economic unrest, the COVID crisis. There's still, I mean, there's a million things going on, political unrest. Um, does it make sense right now in this crazy climate where all that stuff is going on for people to invest both time and resources in social media to generate business opportunities or should they kind of wait till things slow down and then get into it? So, okay. So let, let's take a look at what's happening now. And I, I can draw a parallel to the Great Recession of 2008, when it's proven that companies that spent money on marketing during it, because it was cheaper to spend money, because most people pulled out, during it and after ended up with a stronger brand, more business, and more market share. So I'll, I'll throw some stats at you. 85% of people uh, uh, are open to new brands right now in a crisis. They look at how brands respond to a crisis, whether or not they decide to do business with them or not, right? So you right now, you have more people online, you have costs for uh, 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 promoting through social media lower than 
uh, it's been in probably a year, six months to a year. I'd have to take a look to see exactly what that is. That's a good, good point. Anyway, costs are lower. You have an incredible moment in time. Matter of fact, we convinced one of our national uh, accounts that uh, manufacturers uh, equipment for implants. Really exciting stuff. Really. Don't get out of your chairs, everyone. I know you want to talk about it. But we convinced them is to get out there now because their target markets are more apt to select a new brand within this crisis. Everything's jumbled. Look, I don't know a single person that's not living in some higher level of fear or anxiety. We have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. Everything is changing on a weekly, daily basis. We don't know. So all that fear and anxiety from in, in a marketing viewpoint, not a personal creates this opportunity for you to expose your brand to them and they are more receptive. We have seen email open rates get higher. We've seen open rates as high as 45, 46%. And the ensuing click-through rate goes up as well. So people are more receptive to messages, more receptive to brands, your costs are lower. If you have the time and resources, absolutely. I can't, uh, thanks for that softball question, but I can't say that enough. It is an incredible moment in time to be using marketing because it's so advantageous right now. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, th there's a client of mine uh, who, who you actually know uh, who's using search engine marketing. And when the whole thing broke loose with COVID-19, uh, they immediately stopped. They said, let's cancel it right now let's, or let's pause it. And the sales rep was, you're making a mistake. You, you should not be doing this. It's a great time to take advantage of it. And it took a couple of weeks to convince the owner, but he did come back and we're seeing the results now because there's always a delay. Uh, yeah. uh, but but um, it, it, I think I heard you say some just astounding number a few weeks ago at, at the networking group, we both belong to ABA, uh, that social media engagement is up seven or eight hundred percent. Or was that, am I wrong? Uh, it's really, uh, as compared to the same time last year, there's roughly a 20 to 30 percent uptick in use of social media. So I don't. I must be I confusing some that. other number. Must have been some other crazy kook throwing a number around, but uh, yeah, social media use is way up. I mean, yeah, and and by the way, if you you know SEO, um, so here's what's happening in SEO. There's a, a shift, and it you know this COVID crisis thrown gasoline on on digital marketing. It's a shift that's been happening all along, and because of the pandemic, everybody's online. We're online. Oh my gosh, right? You know, I'm in my office, but we can't meet in a conference room. So we're going to be Zoom conferencing in my office with everybody. It's kind of nutty. But uh, be that as it may, SEO, uh, you have to now uh, optimize for language, natural language searches. People are home. They're going, Alexa, can you find me? Blah, blah, blah. Now, everybody doesn't speak as precisely as they type. They use a different set, a different string of words called long tail versus short tail. People tend to type less words and they type, tend to type near me, by the way, for most stuff. So you need to start to uh, optimize your, your websites for natural search, natural language search. It's really, um, I can't stress that enough. So, uh, you know, for that guy, the company that we know together for the SEO, you know, uh, SEO needs to be a balance because search engine marketing is not just organic, but it should be paid as well. There needs to be balance between paid per click and organic. And the decisions is a whole, sh I could talk for an hour on that, which I'm not going to right now. And any uh, final words of wisdom, especially for the individual salespeople that I think are mostly a part of this group, anything that mm -hmm. you can suggest to them that would be if you could give them one tip about how to uh, use marketing themselves, what would that be? Uh, do it. Just do it. So, I, I, yeah, Nike it, baby. So here's the thing. Um, all the salespeople here have, you know, stress trying to find people to market to, uh, make calls, trying to make sales, squeeze it through a Zoom call, um, spend budget. Uh, 20 minutes a day and focus on one social channel. And if you're selling B2B, focus on LinkedIn. 
And in that 15 to 20 minutes, just focus on doing one thing. If it's you're in a group, make a couple of comments. <clears throat> do that in the 20 minutes. The next day, invite a couple of people, make connections, but don't just make connections to send because you want to sell to them. Make connections because of the choices, just like in a networking group. So my, my hack for you guys, because it's an incredibly stressful time, it's very difficult. You don't really have the time and resources to devote to a lead gen program. So use LinkedIn, if you're B2B sales, 15, 20 minutes a day, that's it. Be committed to it, do it every day, 15, 20 minutes a day. We've only got a couple of minutes left, but I do wanna ask a quick question about LinkedIn before we tie things up. What about uh, investing in the premium versions of LinkedIn as opposed to the free version? So um, I, the free version is fabulous because you could do a tremendous amount. The, the next level paid version I've had for the past, uh, I can't remember. I've had, I've had it for a long time. I don't know. I got an email from LinkedIn. I was the 101st, 569 member to join. I don't know. I, it's crazy. Um, so it's difficult for me to recommend paying for it when you don't really use it at all because money will go out the window. If you're using LinkedIn every day for three months, you'll bang on the ceiling of the paid version. That's when you should start to use it. So the paid version allows you advanced search features, allows you to see who's viewing your profile, actual the people themselves viewing your profile, allows you to increase increased in mail, which means you can send a message within LinkedIn to anybody. So those are features, if you deem them important, then yes. But if you don't use LinkedIn, don't pay for it until you start to use it every day and see its value. Otherwise you waste the money. I would take a look, if you're a very high level user, uh, the sales navigator, it's, it's very cool. And uh, about two years ago, I wouldn't recommend it. Now I would for those because they've developed the tool, uh, you know, with Microsoft buying them, they had some back end stuff. Um, I'd recommend looking, recommend using that now. It's a great way to look for leads. Yeah, I, I have to agree that if you're using that search function, that eventually you are going to bump against a limit. I think it's 100 uh, names per month or something like that. And I actually yep. had a guy trying to sell me his services recently, and he shared a screen and showed me uh, uh, the advanced search in Navigator, and it blew me away. If you're actually investing the time on LinkedIn, and I tell salespeople the same thing that you've said a couple of times, 20, 30 minutes a day tops, because uh, you can get sucked in. Oh, uh, man, that man. navigation, the, the advanced navigation was absolutely incredible. Mitch, uh, we're almost out of time. I'm going to see if I can share my screen here so that everybody can see your contact information. Uh, would you just share with people how they can get in touch with you? I think they're seeing it now, but tell them what you do uh, and how you can help people and how they can get in touch with you. Well, thanks. Um, well, obviously you can call me, uh, say hello. Uh, you can email me. Uh, it's a little tough to see my email. It's in blue. It's mtobol at cgtmarketing.com. I also started to uh, develop, I have about seven or eight, what I call quick reads. They're single sheet PDFs, uh, ungated, meaning you could just go on and download them. They're on the resources page of my website, which is cgtmarketingllc.com. And uh, I'm continually generating content on what to do now. So, uh, you know, frequent visits to see what's happening. If you're not on the email list, I have sign up and you can get our wonderful emails on a weekly basis uh, with tips and tricks and hacks and information on what to do. I would also recommend that they uh, sign up for your blog, uh, which I get regularly. And uh, while I don't do everything you recommend, I, I either do it or I go, I should be doing that. Uh, Mitch, <laughs> thank you so much for your time today. Uh, My pleasure, I Jeff. And thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Always a pleasure, Jeff. Mitch Tobel, you are the marketing guy. You are my go-to guy for marketing and things like that. And uh, I can't tell you well, how much you. I appreciate it. I also appreciate everybody who's joined us today. Uh, thank you so much for being a part of the Sales Pro Network. Uh, please tell your friends if you're getting value out of it. We'd love to grow this group as huge as possible. Uh, and I'll leave you with a quote today. Tough, tough times never last, but tough people do. Go out and be tough. Thanks again, Mitch. Bye, everyone. Have a great day.